Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Morton was writing after the second world war okay, at a time where the institution of science was under attack and scientists have become self conscious about uh, their being integrated with society. Being a functionalist in sociology Morton was using the same functionalist method of analysis to describe the relation between science and society. He takes the institutional goal, okay. he takes the institutional goal and function of science to be the extension of certified knowledge. Okay. I mean the, uh, uh, the relevant uh, definition of which he takes to be empirically confirmed and logically consistent uh, statements of regularities. Hence, Merton is mainly concerned with the cultural structure of science as an institution that is not with the method of science, but its mores and norms. We will we'll, we'll discuss methods of science after, after dealing with science as a social institution um, uh, 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 as a whole uh, uh, and Mertonian uh, ethos of science in particular. Okay? Uh, but, but what should be the moral framework, what should be the normative structure of science and its practitioners was highlighted by uh, Martin. Okay? What do we mean by the ethos of science? For Martin, it is the effectively toned complex of values and norms which is held to be binding on the man of science. The norms are expressed in the form of prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences and permissions. We will we'll, we'll come to this, I mean, uh, I mean we will we'll discuss, let us go one by one. Okay. Martin also, if you look at uh, 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 the institutional imperatives, Martin flags out, uh, uh, Martin flags four institutional imperatives. I mean four ethos of modern science, okay? uh, thereby he delineated uh, 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 four institutional imperatives in terms of universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. We will we'll come to this point a little while later. In this lecture, we will we'll try to complete this. What? One question that comes up. Okay? is whether Martin thinks that these imperatives are ideals and norms that scientists actually act on or rather ideals or norms that they are supposed to act on. I mean what ought to be, what should be, they are prescriptive in nature, they are normative in nature, okay? in a more prescriptive sense. On the one hand, he says, Martin says that these norms fasten the scientist's conscience or his superego, which seems like a descriptive claim. But on the other hand, he says uh, that he is trying to answer the question which social structure provides an institutional context for the fullest measure of development of science which science so, which sounds prescriptive okay the distinction that he draws between motivational and institutional norms and ideals also strikes interesting he argues i mean 
on the one hand motivational norms and values ideals and on the other uh, institutional norms and values. There is a difference between norm and value. You see. Norm as I said earlier that uh, norms evolve over upon social acceptance. Okay. When I say rule, rules are legally bound. Okay. Rules are uh, uh, rules can be codified whereas, norms may not be codified. Values are uh, higher ordered norms. I will say speak the truth always, honesty is the best policy, they are values, okay? they are not norms. Okay? I mean Martin argues for instance that even though scientists may not individually be disinterested or, or unbiased, there is something distinctive about the institution of science that makes scientists behave that way in an institutional level. In other words, it is because the institution enjoins disinterested activity that is that it is to be the interest uh, that it is to the interest of scientists to confirm to this norm and internalize it. Martin will 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 come to this uh, I mean uh, I, uh, I hope you are able to follow uh, the 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 aspects of um, motivational and institutional norms. Okay, motivational norm and value uh, may be uh, related to the way curiosity-driven research is being carried out. When I talk about when Martin talked about institutional norms and values it refers to institutional mandates. If you look at different institutional settings in India, CSIR labs have different institutional mandates whereas, ICAR labs I mean Indian Council of Agricultural Research um, sponsored research institutions have different institutional mandates. That is why you will find mostly CSIR labs they work in the laboratory whereas, ICAR labs they work in the field. What you find molecular biologists in CSIR labs, okay? I mean CSIR sponsored research institutions, they work in the laboratory and plant breeders in ICAR sponsored research institutions, they work in the field. Perhaps the, the, the time has come today, how to integrate these two how there must be a cognitive empathy as Weber put it, okay? that understanding the role of the other, understanding the need of the other. Okay? Uh, a molecular biologist must be able to understand the, the need of the field, a plant breeder at the same time must understand the constraints of the laboratory, only after which will we be able to come out with some implementable or deliverable solutions. Okay. Martin after having, having discussed the motivational and institutional norms and values, Martin also talk, talked about the relationship between scientists and the public. This is very important. He seems to see a benefit of uh, benefit in scientists being in a way detached from the lay person. He says the, he said this because the scientists do not have or do not stand vis-a-vis -vis lay person in the same fashion as the physician and lawyer. The possibility of exploiting the credulity and ignorance of the lay person is reduced. What, what I mean here that, that, that the scientists uh, must try to understand the gap between the world of science and the world of the public. It is also a bounden duty on the part of the world of science and its practitioners 
to make public aware to make the public aware of scientific temper okay we'll we'll come to this i mean this scientific temper and so on over a period of time the ethos of science uh, i mean uh, it refers to uh, the effectively toned complex of values and norms which is held to be binding on the man of science okay the norms are expressed uh, in the form of prescriptions proscriptions uh, uh, preferences and permissions when i say when martin said prescriptions he meant norms normative framework when he said proscriptions those norms which are legally bound preferences which uh, preferences which are which come under motivational norms and values permissions which come under institutional norms and values then i repeat prescriptions i mean normative framework normative structure of science proscriptions are those norms which are legally bound preferences are those norms which come under the scope and ambit of motivational norms and values or ideals permissions which are which come under institutional mandates institutional norms values and ideals okay now if you if you look at these prescriptions proscriptions preferences and permissions okay they are legitimized in terms of institutional values these imperatives transmitted by precept and example and reinforced by sanctions are in varying degrees internalized by the scientists themselves thus fastening their scientific conscience or if one prefers the latter day phrase their super ego okay perhaps perhaps the world of science is not able to not able to overcome these four walls of science okay although the ethos of science has not yet been codified that's why i said norms are usually not codified to the way rules are codified because rules are usually legally bound whereas norms are not legally bound okay that's why although the ethos of science has not been codified it can be inferred from the moral consensus of scientists as expressed in use and habits practices okay in countless writings on the scientist scientific spirit and in moral indignation directed towards uh, contraventions of the ethos okay we can we can go ahead with this an examination of the ethos of uh, modern science is only a limited introduction to a larger problem what is that i mean the comparative study of the institutional structure of science it is very important whenever we 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 study a particular phenomenon it is important to make a comparison comparative sociology teaches us how to look at a particular phenomenon through a through the perspective of historical sociology philosophical anthropology political economy okay then what we see what we see that then the ethos of science i repeat if it is the effectively toned complex of values and norms uh, which is held to be binding on the man of science and these norms are expressed in the form of one normative framework called prescriptions the norms secondly the norms which are legally bound that is proscriptions and also the motivational norms and values i mean preferences and institutional norms and values i mean permissions this this is very important okay then what is the goal of science the institutional goal of science 
is the extension of certified knowledge which can be spelt out in terms of its technical methods. When Martin talked about technical methods, okay, the technical methods employed towards uh, the end, I mean towards the uh, towards this end of uh, certified knowledge, okay, provide the relevant definition of knowledge. What is that? I mean, when I say technical methods, I mean they are empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities, these are often predictions. I uh, when Martin um, uh, used uh, the term uh, predictions, he did not use the term predictions the way an, an astrologer might have done. Okay? This is not the way we use STS scholars use prediction. Okay? The way we use prediction suppose I will say that uh, given the rice production in India uh, or, or the production of rice in India was x amount or quantity in 1951, x plus 1 in 1961, x plus 6 in 1971, then what then how do we predict the production of rice in 2021. I mean, we, we take uh, geographical indicators, we take the, uh, the agricultural production, the productivity, the, the quality of soil, the, the quality of seed, uh, the farming practices and so on in mind. That is why we, we, we make those predictions, not prediction in, in an astrological sense, okay? prediction in a very scientific sense. Okay? The institutional imperatives, which, which, uh, which may be termed as mores, okay? those mores, I mean the social mores that are widely observed and considered to have greater moral significance than others, I mean mores include an aversion uh, for societal taboos uh, such as uh, incest. Okay? The mores of a society usually predict legislation uh, prohibiting their taboos. Okay? Uh, the institutional uh, um, uh, imperatives or mores, okay? they derive from the goal and the methods. Then what is the goal? Now, the, the, the goal, the institutional goal of science is the extension of certified knowledge okay, as we have already discussed and here the methods such as empirically confirmed statements of regularities uh, uh, and logically state consistent uh, uh, statements of regularities. I mean you one must be consistent, one must try to seek knowledge, one must be able to certify knowledge. Okay? I mean, uh, the, the, therein, therein lies the difference between, as we discussed yesterday, the different, the distinction between science from religion, uh, that uh, uh, religion uh, uh, may also produce knowledge, but the production of knowledge is based on beliefs, uh, whereas science produces knowledge on the basis of empirically confirmed statements of uh, statements and uh, logically consistent, uh, 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 empirically confirmed and logically consistent uh, statements of regularities. Okay? These are important aspects. The entire, the entire structure uh, of technical and moral norms implements the final objective in the world of science. What is that? The technical norm of empirical evidence must be adequate and reliable, which is a prerequisite for sustained true prediction. Okay? 
adequacy is important and reliability is important. Okay. That though that the aspects of adequacy, uh, uh, the, the aspects of adequacy and reliability are very much contingent upon the empirically conformed and logically consistent statements of regularities. Okay. The technical norm of logical consistency a prerequisite for systematic and valid pred prediction. The mores of science, the moral framework of science, the ideals of science okay, possess a methodological rationale, but they are binding not only because they are procedurally efficient, but because they are believed right and good. It is not simply an epistemological question, but also an ethical consideration. That is what we discussed earlier, which STS scholars are deeply engaged in. Okay? That is why uh, when you combine epistemology with ethics, it becomes philosophy of science. Okay? This, this, these, these mores of science. Okay? They are moral as well as technical prescriptions. More that that's a, that's why when we when we look at the four institutional imperatives which which uh, 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 Merton uh, flags out flags that uh, uh, he 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 held a, he held aloft the banner of. Uh, uh, social institution of science uh, okay in terms of uh, four institutional imperatives or four ethos of science i mean these four institutional imperatives namely universalism communism disinterestedness and organized skepticism okay they become a part and parcel of they become uh, a part and parcel of the ethos of modern science Okay. Then what we have learnt till till before we move on to this 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 area, that what we have done, we have learnt uh, the ethos of science as effectively to effectively toned complex of values and norms which is binding to be uh, uh, or which is held to be binding on the man of science. The norms are expressed in the form of prescriptions, proscriptions, permissions and preferences. The goal of science we have discussed that is the extension of certified knowledge which can be spelt out in terms of its technical methods and these technical methods include empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities. Okay? And the imperatives of science derive, the, uh, derive from the goal and methods. Okay? More precisely, Merton thinks that empirical methodology is a prerequisite for sustained true prediction and logical consistency a prerequisite for systematic and valid prediction. Okay? And these imperatives are binding not only because they are procedurally efficient, but because they are believed to be right and good, believed right and good. Okay. I think, I think uh, from here onward, what we will do, we will try to cover, we will try to, to uh, foreground the four ethos of science at length and in detail. Okay. Universalism, what is this universalism? Universalism finds immediate expression in the canon, in the rule that truth claims whatever their source are to be subjected to pre-established impersonal criteria. What do we mean by pre-established impersonal criteria? I mean consonant with observation and not with and, and, and consonant with observation as well as consonant with previously confirmed knowledge. Okay? I mean they must be empirically uh, confirmed and logically consistent. Then, the acceptance or rejection of 
a scientific claim entering the lists of science is not is not the acceptance or rejection of a scientific claim should not depend upon the personal or social background or attributes of that protagonist or the scientist i mean to uh, to put it differently the acceptance or rejection of a scientific claim should not depend upon the social or personal background of the person offering that claim okay i mean uh, the the person's uh, race nationality um, uh, religion uh, region class caste uh, uh, gender uh, personal qualities uh, and as such irrelevant uh, uh, when you when you accept or reject a scientific I mean that is how science maintains its objectivity. Okay? That is why uh, they, these, these factors, these subjective factors uh, okay, must be done away with uh, when you offer a scientific claim for Merton. Okay? That is why objectivity uh, precludes particularism. The circumstance that scientifically verified formulations refer in that specific sense to objective sequences and correlations mm, uh, uh, militates against all efforts to impose particularistic criteria of validity. Okay? If you uh, uh, look at this, I mean uh, the institution of science is very much a part of a larger social structure with which it is not always integrated that is why it, it gets isolated from the larger framework of society, larger social framework, society framework. When the larger culture opposes universalism, the ethos of science is subjected to serious strain. That is why uh, science is, uh, I, mean, um, I mean science is always situated uh, within a larger social framework which may oppose universalism. That is why ethnocentrism uh, is not compatible with universalism. This is very important. Okay? Here, Merton notes that even when violated, the force of the norm is still evident. I mean, then, but what is ethnocentrism? We know what is universalism. I mean, the acceptance or rejection of a scientific claim should not depend upon the personal or social background of the person offering that claim. Now, what is ethnocentrism? Why ethnocentrism is incompatible uh, with uh, uh, universalism? What is ethnocentrism? Ethnocentrism is a term which was coined by William Graham Sumner in 1906 in Folkwich to describe he used this term ethnocentrism, Sumner used this term ethnocentrism to describe the prejudicial attitudes between in groups and out groups and the way the members of in groups uncritically evaluate and unquestionably put their own cultures own behavior, own customs on a higher pedestal vis-a-vis -vis other cultures, other behavior patterns and other customs. I mean, if I say today my culture is superior to your culture, it is essentially ethnocentric in nature. That is why for a long time, for a long time different social groups claimed even today. Uh, 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 they claim that no uh, 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 culture of X is superior to culture of Y. This cultural superiority, racial superiority, caste superiority, okay? uh, uh, I mean gender superiority, sexual superiority, sex superiority, superiority based on sex, they are myths. 
one must understand this. Okay, if uh, uh, I mean uh, that's why ethnocentrism, uh, uh, the way it has crippled our society, our culture, our economy, our polity must be understood. Okay, that's why when we when we look at uh, ethnocentrism, which is based on. Uh, 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 the biological school of evolutionary theory. Okay, uh, I think a modern society, a more civilized society, uh, uh, must restrict uh, uh, the entry of an ethnocentric worldview. Okay, uh, ethnocentrism uh, is uh, not compatible with universalism. Okay, perhaps for this reason, uh, perhaps for this reason, Martin. Uh, notes that even when violated the force of the norm of universalism is still relevant. Okay? Even under counter pressure scientists of all nationalities adhere to the universalistic standard in more direct terms. The international impersonal virtually anonymous character of science is reaffirmed and denial of the norm of universalism is conceived as a breach of faith. Okay? Then universalism finds further expression in the demand that carriers be open to talents. Okay? I mean the uh, science to be a meritocracy. Since the goal of science is to further our knowledge precluding and precluding competent practitioners would impede this goal, access to scientific careers should based uh, should uh, 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 scientific careers uh, uh, should be based on competence alone. Okay? Competence the way we, we uh, discussed today is uh, uh, was not there in the framework of Merton. Okay? I mean, uh, he was trying to make okay, a more open democratic society, whereas the way uh, different sections of the society have been marginalized just because on the basis of their ascriptive qualities in India as well as in the West, they should not, their concerns should not be marginalized on the basis of their ascribed qualities on the basis of their births. But on the basis, but their, their, I mean their, their concerns, their achievements, their, their, their accomplishments, uh, their voices must be taken into consideration on the basis of their achieved qualities, not ascribed qualities. Achieved statuses, not ascribed statuses. Universalism, okay, for Merton. According to Martin, universalism is a uh, is a less affair. I mean, democratic principle. Okay, as Martin writes, okay, impersonal criteria of accomplishment and not fixation of status characterize the open democratic society. Okay, I mean, when we when we do this, okay, uh, democratization according to Merton is tantamount to the progressive elimination of restraints upon the exercise and development of socially uh, valued capacities. Impersonal criteria of accomplishment and not fixation of status characterize the, dem the open democratic society and in so far as uh, such constraints do persist, they are viewed as obstacles in the path of full democratization. Thus, in so far as laissez-faire democracy permits the accumulation of differential advantages for certain segments of the population, differentials that are not bound up with demonstrated differences in capacity, the democratic process leads to increasing regulation by political authority. And under 
changing conditions, new technical forms of organization okay, must be introduced to preserve and extend equality of opportunity. And now, in Indian context, we have, uh, in STS, we talk about equality of opportunity, which he dealt uh, into uh, uh, in the 1940s, 30s, 40s, and so on. And the political apparatus may be required to put democratic values into practice and to maintain universalistic standards. Okay. Now, this equality of opportunity to do science equality of opportunities to practice science okay, leads our discussion to another uh, institutional imperative, another ethos of science namely community. Let us come to the second integral part of the ethos of science that is communism. Communism in the non technical and extended sense of common ownership of goods okay, is a second integral element of the scientific ethos. The substantive findings of science are a product of social collaboration and are assigned to the community. These, these, substantial, these substantive findings of science constitute a common heritage in which the equity of the individual producer is severely limited. An uh, eponymous law or theory does not enter into the exclusive possession of uh, possession of the discoverer or their hires, nor do the Moors bestow upon them special rights to use and disposition. Property rights, the way we talk about property rights in layman's language, uh, they are different from property rights in science. Okay? Uh, we will discuss intellectual property rights in science, uh, uh, especially in the context of developing countries, uh, say India, uh, uh, we will discuss these things later on. But, but so far as the ethos of science and within ethos of science, communism as an integral part of such scientific ethos is concerned, that property rights in science are whittled down to uh, a bare minimum by the rationale of the scientific ethic. The scientists claim to their intellectual property is limited to that of recognition and esteem, which if the institution functions with a uh, modicum of efficiency uh, is roughly commensurate with the significance of the increments brought to the common fund of knowledge. Eponymy, for example, the Copernican system, Boyle's law is thus at once a uh, uh, mnemonic and commemorative device. Okay? Given such institutional emphasis on recognition and esteem as the sole uh, property right of the scientist is the of the scientists is their discovery the concern with scientific priority becomes a normal response. Normal, when I say normal, I mean norm bound response, okay? normative structure bound response. Those controversies over priority, whether the, 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 the property right in science should be owned by an individual scientist or the community of scientists, okay, such controversies over uh, scientific priority becomes, uh, I mean, uh, over, over priority, uh, which uh, punctuate the history of modern science are generated by the institutional accent on originality. Their issues 
or uh, competitive uh, cooperation. The products of competition are communized and esteem accrues to the producer. Nations take up claims to priority and fresh entries into the commonwealth of science are tagged with the names of nationals. Okay? We can witness the controversies ranging from uh, uh, ranging over the rival claims of uh, Newton and Leibniz uh, to the differential calculus. You can look at the history of differential calculus by uh, uh, Newton and Leibniz. It is interesting to see in the in the context of history of science uh, the way <coughs> uh, I mean history of scientific controversies. Uh, 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 but but. I am not going to dwell much upon this, this controversy between uh, Newton and Leibniz. It is interesting how Newton being very powerful, uh, I mean he was the president of the Royal Society of London and uh, the way he uh, uh, and that there were controversies who first uh, uh, invented differential calculus, whether it was Newton or Leibniz, it is still a matter of controversy. Okay? But this all does not challenge the status of scientific knowledge as common property, whether this, this uh, whether Newton invented differential calculus or Leibniz dif invented differential calculus, but, but the scientific community always uh, used to own this, uh, the, the, there was no controversy at that time uh, so, uh, about uh, individual property right. Okay? I mean the institutional conception of science as part of the public opinion uh, or, or as part of the public domain okay, is linked with the imperative for communication of findings. Secrecy is the pressure for diffusion of results is reinforced by the institutional goal of advancing the boundaries of knowledge and by the incentive of recognition which is of course contingent upon publication. A scientist who does not communicate his uh, or her important discoveries to the scientific fraternity okay, becomes the target for ambivalent responses. They are esteemed for their talents and perhaps for their modesty, but institutionally considered their modesty is seriously misplaced okay, in view of the moral compulsive uh, for sharing the wealth of science. Okay. The communal character of science, communal when I say I do not do not mean uh, in the way today uh, we use the term communal, communal means I mean which is based on community. Okay? Uh, this community based character of science is further reflected in the recognition by scientists of their dependence upon a cultural heritage to which they know uh, they lay no differential claims. Okay? That is why uh, uh, that is why, uh, if I quote Newton, he said, uh, if I have seen farther, it is by standing on the uh, shoulders of giants. This, this, if, if I have seen farther, okay, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. This, this statement expresses at once a sense of indebtedness to the common heritage and a recognition of the essentially cooperative and selectively cumulative quality of scientific achievement. The humility of scientific genius is not simply culturally appropriate, but results from the realization that scientific advance involves the collaboration of past and present generations. The communism that we see, okay, the communism within science that we see of the, uh, I mean the communism of the scientific ethos is incompatible with the definition of technology as private property in a capitalistic economy. Current writings on the frustration of science reflect this conflict. Okay? Patents uh, proclaim ex exclusive patent rights, I mean patents over different products, processes. Okay? Uh, proclaim exclusive rights of use and often no use or non-use. The suppression of invention defines or, 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 or the suppression of inventions denies uh, the rationale of scientific production and diffusion 
as may be seen from the court's decision in the case of US versus American Bell uh, telephone company. Okay. You can look at uh, the history of this, the, I mean the inventor is one who has discovered something of value, it is his absolute property, he may withhold the knowledge of it from the public. Okay. The, these, these such tensions okay, were not there earlier. I mean whatever discoveries have been made, they must be made to the public. Uh, the fruits of any technological development must be enjoyed by the, uh, the public at large. Okay. Then responses to such conflicting situations that whether the community of scientists, the practitioners of science uh, should have access to uh, the discoveries uh, and inventions or the individual scientist will uh, have absolute authority, absolute uh, ownership over the product. Okay such responses to such conflict situation have varied. A defensive measure, okay? uh, some scientists have come to uh, uh, patent their work to ensure it is being made available for the public use. That is also uh, called negative patenting, people use it, uh, we will we'll come to this point when we talk about intellectual property rights regime in uh, science in India, I mean developing countries uh, uh, particularly in India. Okay. For according to Merton, some scientists also seek to resolve this conflict by advocating socialism. This is also important. Okay. These proposals, both those which demand economic returns for their scientific discoveries and those who demand uh, those which demand a change in the social system to let science get on with the job reflect discrepancies in the conception of intellectual property. Okay. To, to, to uh, uh, recapitulate uh, this ethos of science, I mean uh, communism, okay. I mean established scientific knowledge should be accessible to all members of the scientific community to use, explore and so on. As a result, communication of scientific results is prized and secrecy about them scorned. If a law or a theory is named after a person, this only bestows prestige upon the person so named, usually because the law or theory is a significant contribution. Since this is the only privilege of ownership of a theory, it becomes a prized possession. That is why we say. Uh, uh, laws of motion, Newtonian laws of motion, theory of relativity, Einsteinian theory of relativity. Okay. Merton notes that originality and priority okay, are accented because of this. Okay. That is why communism has become more important, okay, especially in the wake of the, the, the IPR regime throughout the, uh, I mean IPR regime across the continents in the globe and especially in the context of developing countries uh, including India. Okay. Coming to the third integral part or third uh, integral scientific ethos, okay, which is disinterestedness, okay, it is not to be equated with altruism or interested action with uh, egoism. Science must include disinterestedness as a basic institutional element. Okay. As I said, science must not be equated with altruism um, or interested of action of with egoism, such equivalences confuse institutional and motivational levels of analysis. A passion for knowledge, idle curiosity, altruistic concern with uh, uh, the benefit to community and a host of other so special motives have been attributed to the scientists, I mean the practitioners of science. The quest for distinctive motives appears to have been misdirected. It is rather a distinctive pattern of institutional control over uh, control of a uh, 
wide range of motives which characterizes the behavior of scientists. For once, the institution enjoins disinterested activity. It is to the interest of scientists to conform on pain of sanctions and in so far as the norm has been internalized on pain of psychological conflict. The virtual absence of fraud in the annals of science which appears exceptional when compared with the record of other spheres activity has at times been attributed to the personal qualities of scientists. By implication, scientists are required uh, or, or by, by implication scientists are, uh, are recruited from the ranks of those who exhibit uh, an unusual degree of moral integrity. There is in fact no satisfactory evidence that such is the case. As Merton argued, a more plausible explanation may be found in certain distinctive characteristics of science itself involving as it does the, the verifiability of results. Scientific research is under the ex exacting scrutiny of fellow experts. Otherwise put and doubtless the observation can be interpreted at, at least majesty uh, the, the, or the, the activities of scientists are subject to rigorous policing to a degree perhaps unparalleled in any other field of activity. Okay. I mean when I when I come to this point, I mean when I, I, I say this, I mean scientific claims should not be put forth solely to further one's interests or advance one's own agenda. Merton first notes that disinterestedness is an institutional obligation. It should not come in the way of way of personal interests and ideologies. When it is an institutional obligation, we must remember that it should not be confused with any individual motive. Scientists may have in any number of individual drives or desires, fame, curiosity, altruism, etc. Okay, that motivate them. The institutional control of a wide range of these motives better characterizes what is central to science and its ethos. This explains why science is little, the, why, why the, this, this explains why there is little fraud in science. Martin explains that this comes about because scientists are well polished by rigorous empirically confirmed tests, logically consistent tests performed by other scientists. That is why pre-established impersonal criteria, prior knowledge is very important in science to maintain disinterestedness. Scientists also have, have a very different uh, uh, relationship to lay clientele uh, than other professions. When there is a stronger relationship between lay people and scientists, incentives for fraud and pseudoscience become more pressing. This is also interesting. In this connection, the field of science differs somewhat from that of other professions. The scientists do not stand vis-a-vis -vis a lay clientele in the same fashion as do the physician or lawyer for example, as we have discussed. The possibility of exploiting the uh, credulity, ignorance and dependence of the layman is thus considerably reduced. Fraud and irresponsible claims are even less likely than among the service professions. To the extent that the scientist layman relation does become paramount, there develop incentives for evading the mores of science. The abuse of expert authority and the creation of pseudosciences are called into play when the structure of control exercised by qualified uh, compares is rendered, uh, rendered ineffectual. It is probable, it may be probable, it, it is probable that uh, the, the reputability of science and its lofty ethical status in the estimate of the layman 
is in no small measure due to technological achievements. Every new technology bears witness to the integrity of the scientists. Science realizes its uh, claims, however, its authority can be and is appropriated for interested purposes, precisely because the laity is often ill. Okay? The, 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 uh, the, the laity is often in no position to distinguish spurious from genuine claims to such authority. Okay? The presumably scientific pronouncements of totalitarian spokesperson on race or economy or history are for the uninstructed laity for the same order as newspaper reports of an expanding universe or wave mechanics. Okay? I mean, the borrowed authority of science bestows prestige on the unscientific doctrine. What, I, what we mean to do here in the form of these three ethos of science, universalism, communism and disinterestedness, we, have, we are trying to cover the institutional imperatives, institutional goal, institutional control, institutional obligation on the part of individual scientists, okay, so far as the, the institutional normative structure is, uh, is concerned. Okay. Now, how to arrive at the truth, having followed the principles of empirically uh, confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities assumes greater significance if we come to the fourth institutional imperative, fourth ethos of science. It is very important. Okay? I mean the, the last one organized skepticism is variously interrelated with the other elements of the, of the scientific ethos, namely universalism communism and disinterestedness. It is both a methodological and an institutional mandate. We have discussed institution, institutional mandates earlier, namely universalism, communism and disinterestedness, but it is important to note this methodological mandate. What does it imply? That scientific claims should be evaluated by suspending judgments and scrutinizing claims in terms of empirically confirmed and logically consistent considerations alone. When I say uh, uh, organized skepticism, I mean temporary suspension uh, uh, or temporary suspension of judgment or postponement of judgment until and unless all facts are at hand. If we do not have adequate and reliable facts, verifiable facts at hand, observable facts at hand, then we must try to keep on postponing our judgment or we must keep on temporarily suspending or withholding our judgment. Okay? The temporary suspension of judgment and the detached scrutiny of beliefs in terms of empirical and logical criteria have periodically involved science in conflict with other institutions. Suppose other institutions, they, uh, they immediately come to a conclusion, but science cannot afford to do that. Science should not afford to do that unless and until all facts are at hand. Okay? That is why Science which asks questions of fact, including potentialities uh, concerning every aspect of nature and society may come into conflict with other attitudes toward the same idea or, or uh, the, the same data which have been crystallized and often ritualized by other institutions. The scientific investigators do not preserve the cleavage between the sacred and the profane between that which requires 
the uncritical respect and that which can be objectively analyzed. Okay? Now, what have we discussed till now? Very quickly. Okay? We started with the, 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 the realm of technology, science and society, their interrelationships, the models of the relationship between science, technology and society, namely the linear model, the interactionist model and the embedded model. And then we tried to provide certain examples which will challenge the, the idea of technological determinism. Okay? And by the construction of the New York bridge by Robert Mosses and then the, the way scientific knowledge and the associated technological artifacts have profoundly destabilizing changes both at the levels of uh, both at the level of cognitive and political and those these changes uh, have been at the level of uh, uh, ontology what is being what is existing what is in reality okay but now we are going ahead with what ought to be to address the problems of what is being what is existing we must have some normative structure prescriptive structure and thereon we started discussing the the mortonian normative structure of science i mean in the form of ethos of science which are effectively toned complex of values and norms which is held to be binding on the man of science and these norms are expressed in the form of prescriptions proscriptions preferences and permissions then we discussed the goal of science the imperatives of science and four institutional imperatives of science in the form of four ethos of science which mark uh, which martin flags namely universalism communism disinterestedness and organized skepticism okay and there we tried to look at what ought to be what should be what should be the prescribed form of uh, uh, scientific practices um, and so on okay and in the next week, we will start with a few assignments okay? and then we will try to cover uh, uh, the methods of science uh, in the next few weeks. Okay? Thank you.